I'm Jen Nechterlein, College and Career Counselor here at Central, and we're coming live from home, lots of different homes um, tonight. As always, we, we aim to do things in person. That has always been our goal um, this school year, but this program um, serves a little bit better virtually as we have six representatives tonight from a variety of institutions, not just in New Jersey, surrounding states and um, North and South, and it just works a little bit better when we can do this virtually. And honestly, I think it's a better night to be at home with this weather. So I'm glad you're here to join us. I know we've got a lot of students on, probably lots of sophomores, lots of juniors. If we were in the auditorium, I'd ask you to raise your hand and tell us, but um, I'm looking at your names and I see a lot of familiar, um, familiar people. So tonight's program is a little bit different um, than any program you've attended at Central. I know just a couple of weeks ago, we had close to a thousand people for our, our county college fair. It was an awesome night, and I know a lot of you were there. And then we've held a lot of seminars on just general college planning as it pertains to what we do at Central um, in the early years and then in junior and senior year. But tonight is a little different. Tonight, you get to hear from admissions, from the people who uh, make decisions, so who read your applications, who recruit, visit, uh, make decisions, and are on the other end of this process. So we brought together um, panelists, um, esteemed experts, um, dear colleagues of ours to talk with you tonight about admission. I'm gonna moderate with a couple questions um, and allow them to just give you some really great advice on this process. This is kind of an informal, casual dialogue tonight. We don't have any formal presentation, no screen sharing. You're just gonna see us throughout the next um, hour and a half or so. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and let each of them introduce themselves and just give you a couple fast facts about their institution. Once we get through all six, we will go ahead and um, get into some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Isabella from Boston University. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabella Luizzi. I'm a senior assistant director on the Board of Admissions at BU, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, to just give you a couple of fast facts, as we're saying, about Boston University, we are a large private teaching and research institution. Um, we're actually the fourth largest private institution in the US. Um, we are most certainly an urban institution. We're really located right in the center of Boston. I usually will describe our campus as having kind of a best of both worlds feeling where you know that you're on a college campus when you're at BU, but you're also very much in the city of Boston. There's hustle and bustle and big buildings and the subway goes right through our campus. So definitely has that urban feeling to it. Um, we have 10 schools and colleges, 16,000 undergraduates studying over 300 programs of study, which is a lot of options, I know, but it gives a lot of opportunity for academic flexibility, the opportunity to do double majors across schools, do a major and a minor. Um, and really, no matter what you're studying, you will also be engaging with the liberal arts at BU. It's a big part of who we are. All students um, participate in the BU Hub, which is essentially our take on a liberal arts education requirement. All students will do that in addition to their major or majors. Um, outside the classroom, there's plenty of opportunity to get in that more hands-on learning, whether that be through study abroad. We have over 70 different study abroad programs, um, internships, around 90% of our students have at least one internship during their time at BU, um, and through research. We have a program called Europe, Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. And through that program, we give $1 million of funding to undergraduate students every single year to participate in research. Um, beyond academics, when it comes to just student life, being a student at BU, our students really find their communities through their student organizations. We have over 450. If you have an interest, you will find that interest in some form as a student org. And we guarantee housing for all four years. So we have a really strong residential community on our campus as well. Um, but I'll leave it there. And we can certainly um, talk more about specifics of the calendar fund. Oh, and I'm also going to put a link in the chat if you are interested in Boston University um, and want to get more information in the future, you can fill out this link with your name and your email. Thanks, Isabella. I'm going to turn it over to Tony Jackson, NJIT. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for visiting tonight. My name is Tony Jackson. I am the Director of Recruitment at New Jersey Institute of Technology. So a little bit of information about us. We are a public research university and uh, STEM is our focus. Um, we're kind of a mid-sized university. We have a total enrollment at NJIT of 11,000 
of 600 students. Primarily, that's made up of our undergraduate population. That's about 900 students. Uh, we're very diverse. Uh, we have students from about 40 different states in the union and about 79 different countries. And so uh, a little bit of what your world's going to look like when you get to uh, the work world is that you're going to be interacting with people from all over the country and all over the world. And so uh, what happens outside the classroom is a great education benefit to you in and of itself. Uh, STEM is the big focus for us in terms of programs we offer. So architecture, computer science, uh, engineering is really what we would call the big dog on our campus. Uh, we have a, a, a magnificent um, makerspace where our engineering students go in there and create stuff and um, develop intellectual properties that they get to keep. Uh, if you haven't been to our campus, I strongly recommend you try to come and get an up close and personal look at us. Uh, we're uh, a gem. I think sometimes when people think of a university that's in an urban environment, particularly a city like Newark, they think about the negative things with regards to like crime and is it going to be safe? And if you get a chance to come on our campus and kind of touch us and feel us and see it for yourself, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that we offer some great, great, great opportunities for students who come to us for the programs that we offer. Uh, total admissions, a uh, total uh, uh, cost to attend the university for an in-state student is a little over $18,000. Any student who's admitted to the university will be considered for a uh, merit scholarship, uh, and they're pretty nice uh, for regularly admitted students, along with students who are admitted to our honors college. I'm going to place a link into our uh, into the chat that'll give you an opportunity to go and get on a mailing list if you're not already on one. Uh, but also will give you a link to some of the upcoming events that we'll be holding on campus here. In fact, we have a uh, winter, I'm sorry, spring open house that's going to be coming up on uh, April 24th. So looking forward to interacting with you the rest of the evening, and thanks for joining again. Thanks, Tony. I am going to turn it over to Jordan from University of Pittsburgh. Thanks, Jen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Winfrey. Um, I operate as an admissions uh, representative, obviously, with the University of Pittsburgh. Um, a little bit about the University of Pittsburgh. Of course, we are settled in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we are in the western part of Pennsylvania. Um, Pittsburgh is a really unique place. It's comprised of close to 90 different neighborhoods altogether, and every neighborhood has their own identity. So we're about, um, I would say, probably two miles from downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, we are settled in the Oakland neighborhood of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, Oakland is considered to be the college town of the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we share Oakland with Carnegie Mellon University and Carlo University. So it's a really sort of inclusive a really nice inclusive environment that our students love. Uh, we are considered to be a medium-sized urban campus. Uh, we have a student population of close to 20,000 undergraduates. So we're certainly not small, but we aren't the largest school either. We're sort of right in between, uh, which, is, which is how we like it. Um, I would like to describe our campus as really sort of giving the best of both worlds. Um, you really get the traditional campus feel. We have a lot of green space a lot of trees and a lot of grass. Uh, you also get the urban environment as well. Uh, we have a lot of tall buildings on campus. Um, actually the centerpiece of our campus, we have a building called, called the Cathedral of Learning. It's actually the second largest educational building in the world. So it's a beautiful piece of architecture. Um, I would highly encourage you guys to come on down and check us out, whether it be virtually or in person. Um, you can check out that building along with um, everything else that we have to offer. Um, as far as programs are concerned, uh, we have over 100 programs to choose from. A lot of our programs are nationally ranked, so we do a lot of things extremely well. You're going to find students that come from all over the world to attend Pitt for a number of different reasons and a number of different programs. Um, specifically, we're really strong when it comes to the sciences, uh, the medical field, uh, business, engineering. Um, but I, I really like to describe the University of Pittsburgh as being a well-rounded university. So we have a number of different programs and majors that, that students are interested in. Uh, we guarantee housing for three years. Um, as far as admissions um, is concerned, we practice rolling admissions. So that means you can apply to us at any time during your senior year. Uh, we do not have early action or early decision deadlines or anything like that. Uh, the rule of thumb is that the earlier that you apply to Pitt, uh, the earlier that you're gonna be receiving your admissions decision back from us. Um, and I always encourage the students that I speak to to apply early. Early in this case would be before November of your senior year, just because seats tend to fill up pretty fast. So I will leave it there. Um, I will go ahead and drop a link in the chat as well so, we can get on, so you can get on our mailing list. Great, thanks, Jordan. I'm gonna turn it over to Jade from Lafayette College. Hi folks, my name is Jade. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me, I'm losing my voice. So <laughs> this is not how we normally sound. Um, I'm from Lafayette College, I'm one of the assistant directors. I actually graduated Lafayette in 2016, majored in psychology with a concentration in neuroscience. Um, and I'm originally from Jersey, so I'm um, in my home area. 
Um, Lafayette is a small private liberal arts school located in Eastern Pennsylvania. So for you folks, it's probably about like a half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on um, west on to 78. So it's really close, which is nice. I highly recommend you folks to visit if you have the opportunity. Um, but we are a small liberal arts school, roughly around 2,700 students. Um, a good chunk of our students, about 25% of them, major in engineering. And so that's the most unique thing about Lafayette is that we have such a strong engineering degree for being a liberal arts school. Um, students who go on to uh, study engineering in Lafayette can also study abroad, which is unique as well. So we encourage our students to go to either Bonn, Germany or Madrid, Spain, taking Lafayette engineering classes and still graduate with ABET accreditation um, without having to stay on for an extra semester. For any other students can study abroad wherever they want and whenever they want. We offer an abundance amount of research for students who want to do um, undergraduate research. You do not have to compete with any graduate students. Um, and we have research in all of our academic disciplines. So it's not just the engineers and it's not just the natural scientists, but you, as a social scientist and as a humanist, we have an abundance of research opportunities. When you think about our campus community, we are, um, we do focus on community, so we are residential. About 95% of our students live in on, on campus owned housing, um, but we have such a wide variety of different environments. About 35 residence halls on campus that span from a whole host of different environments based on the students' preferences. Starting as early as your first year, you have four different environments. And so it's up to you in terms of where you want to live. Um, the academics of Lafayette is kind of divided into four subsections of the, human, the humanists, the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the engineers. Um, so there is, an, a, there is a wide variety of what students can do. You can double major, you can major minor. It's really up to what you're interested in and what you want to pursue in college. Your academic advisor will help you through all four, um, pardon me, through all semesters. And so it's not like you have to make these decisions yourself. If you're interested in learning more about Lafayette, I will put an inquiry card in the chat feature, um, but I hope to hear from you folks soon. Thanks, Jade. I'm gonna turn it over to Evan from Clemson University. Hey y'all, how we doing? Happy Friday Eve, uh, glad to be here with you. Uh, my name is Evan. I am one of the freshman admissions counselors here at Clemson. Um, similar to Jade, I am also a proud alum representing my institution tonight. I graduated in 2019, started this job about a month later because I wasn't ready to leave yet. And as it turns out, I never will be ready to leave. So working out so far so good. Um, but Clemson, for those of you who are unfamiliar, probably gonna be a little bit different than some of the other institutions represented on the call tonight. We are gonna be the southernmost uh, of the six of us. We are located in the top left corner of the state of South Carolina. I'm going to be about halfway between Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, and I don't know what kind of bad weather y'all are currently dealing with, but it looks kind of like this outside right now. When I left my office today, it was about 72 degrees, blue skies and sunny. So if you needed really any reason at all to come see us on campus, that's probably the best one that I could give you uh, at the moment. But uh, from an undergraduate side of things, you're looking at a student body population of about 21 and a half thousand when you lump in the grad population, comes out to just over 27,000 folks total, which is kind of in that not too big, not too small range. So really dig that Goldilocks zone that we're in because it gives us all of the resources and opportunities of a large state school while still having a very small town intimate feel. Um, we are in the city of Clemson, South Carolina, which has a population of less than 15,000. So it's a true college town. If the university wasn't there, you would probably never hear of Clemson, South Carolina. Uh, average class size is gonna be about 32 students, less than 5% of all classes are gonna have more than 100 people in them. So again, despite kind of the large enrollment size, uh, it does feel a lot smaller than it really is. Um, over 80 different majors to choose from, over 100 different minors. So again, good variety of academic opportunities. Um, and then as far as outside of the classroom, we got about 600 different student groups and organizations. A variety of natural resources as well. We're kind of in that uh, Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountain range. So for any kind of hiking, biking, horseback riding, camping, hunting, fishing, a lot of opportunities for that within probably 30 minutes to an hour of campus. And then of course we do have the lake, which is uh, something else pretty unique about Clemson. Um, the backside of campus basically doubles as the border for Lake Hartwell. So um, we have our own beach access point. We got beach volleyball, rowing, sailing, water sports club, anything you want to do to maximize the opportunities that lake gives you. And um, we can hook you up with that as well. And then, of course, Division I varsity athletics never really hurt either. Uh, probably pretty familiar with some of those. We've got a few recent national championships as well. So a um, lot to look forward to both in and outside of the classroom. So if you're coming to see us on campus sometime soon, 
I'm looking forward to having you there, but also looking forward to the rest of this evening as we hopefully share some information and get some questions answered. So I'm you know, looking forward to connecting with y'all. If you have any questions about Clemson, hit me with your best shot. Thanks, Evan. And last but not least, we'll talk with Dan from Rowan University. Everybody, thanks for having me tonight, Jen. Thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is Dan Regal. I'm the Director of Admissions at Rowan University. I'm sure many of you uh, on here have heard of Rowan, um, but for those that you, of you that haven't, uh, we are in South Jersey. Uh, we're about an hour and a half south of, uh, of your high school, about 20 minutes south of Philadelphia, so uh, in a great location, suburban campus. Um, Rowan is a research university. Um, we're actually the fourth fastest growing research university uh, in the nation. Um, we have over 100 programs, uh, majors, everything from engineering, uh, business, communication, and creative arts, uh, education, humanities, and social sciences. So a little bit of everything for students um, and for what you're looking for. Um, we also have two medical schools. We're one of only three uh, schools in the nation that have two separate operating medical schools. Um, and some exciting news that we just announced uh, two months ago, we're opening a school of veterinary medicine. Uh, we'll be the first school in New Jersey to have a vet school, one of only 35 in the nation. Uh, and one of only two schools to have medical schools and a vet school. Um, so a lot of great things happening here. Uh, I've been at Rowan for 18 years. Uh, I went here for undergrad, went here for my master's. So when you combine it all, it's, it's a lot more than 18 years. Um, and, and what I can say is, is Rowan is changing and it's growing uh, every year. Uh, when I started here, we had just under 8,000 students. Uh, currently, we have 22,000 students. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, our average class size is about 20 students. Uh, we don't have lecture halls, everything. All of our classes are very hands-on. Um, our Probably our most popular program and our hardest program to get into uh, is engineering. Uh, and we pride ourselves in the uh, hands-on aspect of our engineering program. Um, the average class size for engineering students is 12 to 14 students. So um, very personalized atmosphere, no lecture halls. Um, State-of-the-art facilities, uh, we're constantly growing and building. Uh, we have lots of clubs and organizations, Division Three athletics, intramurals, club sports, Greek life. Uh, so plenty of things to do to, to get involved with. Uh, we are in a, I guess I, I'll call it a suburban town uh, and we have a great relationship with the town and, and we've built out um, into the town. Uh, we have what's called Rowan Boulevard. Uh, if you've been to the College of New Jersey, they have something similar uh, where it's a, you know, a road with restaurants and, uh, and uh, places to, to hang out for students, um, which, is, which is really exciting. Uh, we offer a number of scholarships and financial aid. 75% of our students do receive some sort of uh, financial assistance. Since we're a state college, we do participate in um, the Garden State Guarantee, which is a new program um, that has come out across the, the state in the last year or so, um, which allows students to receive free tuition uh, based on your family's adjusted gross income. Um, so that may be a, an option for some of you as well. So um, like everybody else, I'm going to drop some links into the chat. Uh, if you want more information, feel free to sign up for our mailing list. You're, you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions um, and look forward to uh, answering your questions tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. So the bonus tonight is learning about six schools that are probably schools a lot of you know about. I was doing some quick math because I love I love crunching numbers when it comes to college admissions and I like probably a lot of my colleagues. And this year we sent over 350 applications in just the senior class to these six schools um, in total. So just to give you context, these are obviously names that are important to us and familiar to you. We're gonna go right into it. And we're gonna, we're gonna start with a question and, and my colleagues know they can unmute and, and go as they wish. But um, because we are in it right now, as, as counselors, we're working through decisions with our seniors and you all are building your class as we approach the national enrollment deadline of May 1st. I would love to know, and I'm sure our audience too that's on tonight, what was trending, what was notable in this year's application cycle, what you saw in applicants, what kind of trends and changes you saw um, coming out of two pretty interesting complex years, what was trending in this year's admission cycle? I'm happy to jump in. Um, for us, our applicant pool keeps growing. <laughs> um, last year it grew about 15,000 and then this year it grew another six or 7,000. Um, so I don't know if it's students 
waiting a year because it was in the middle of the pandemic and they wanted to take a gap year. Um, I think also the fact that we've gone test optional is a contributing factor. Um, and on the topic of test optional, we saw about half of our applicant pool submitting tests and about half not submitting tests. Um, so that's about the same as last year. That wasn't necessarily a trend, um, but this is only our second year being test optional. So it's interesting to see that that's been consistent over the two years. Um, in terms of like interest in different programs, that kind of always fluctuates for us from year to year. We have 10 different schools and colleges. Um, so there's a lot of different programs that students are choosing from, but um, this year, our College of Arts and Sciences was definitely incredibly popular. We, it's our largest school, um, but it's also the school that we got the most applications to. Um, so that's just a, a couple of quick things that I could comment on having seen this year. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think a major trend that we saw as a result of COVID um, is test optional. I mentioned somebody asked a question, 65% um, of institutions across the country uh, have gone test optional. Uh, many have announced that they will continue and will remain test optional. And as a result, that's trickling down. We're all seeing significant increases in applications. So students in the past have thought, you know, I can't apply to that school because I don't have the SAT scores needed. Um, that's not a problem anymore. Uh, and I, I saw someone also ask uh, regarding test optional, um, should you be worried not submitting test scores? Um, and the answer is no, you should. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying that there's a college or two out there that um, may hold it against you, but for the most part, no. If we say we are test optional, we're test optional. Uh, and we're looking, at, we're looking at other things. The other thing I'll mention in terms of trends the last few years that I've seen this um, is looking at the return on investment. Uh, so 10, 15 years ago when I was doing this job, students were choosing colleges based on the campus, the academic programs. And what we're seeing a lot more now is students want to get the best bang for their buck. College is expensive. Um, so looking for those, the best offers um, where campus life, athletics, things like that may have been higher on the list. Um, financials are becoming much more higher on the list, which is making us on the college side uh, look at this more. How can we make this more affordable for our students? This is great. Any others? Anything else you're seeing trending in your applicant pool? Um, maybe in this time where students are thinking about decisions, what else is coming up? Uh, at NJIT, yeah, we uh, as well saw a, a significant increase in our applicant pool both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, and so that's a good problem to have, uh, but it's also very taxing to the staff, you know, particularly we were going through some adjustments with regards to our staff and had some movement there, but uh, we're still waiting our way through it. Um, one of the um, um, bigger um, uh, trends that we saw, um, and it's a good one for us, is that we attracted more students from the Newark area. And that's something that we've always wanted to do. and and the significant thing there was probably us being test optional as well. We've not made a decision uh, going forward about whether we'll remain test optional. And so what we're telling students who plan to come to us for the fall of 23, they said your best interest to take it. Uh, that decision will probably be made sometime uh, the closer we get to um, uh, the new year, I guess. Uh, I don't know, but we'll, we'll, it's, it's, under, it's under review at the higher levels at the university. Um, other trends, we've attracted more women to the university in the last couple of classes. So again, a very, very good uh, situation. Typically schools where STEM is the focus will tend to um, attract more uh, uh, males to the university. So those are a couple of trends that we've seen thus far. I think overall, um, Lafayette's received applications from all 50 states, which is exciting. Um, but then also the silver lining of COVID is that you have such more accessibility to schools from all around the world. And so our international pool just skyrocketed. Um, and so when you think about all the different um, opportunities that you have to engage with schools um, and the information out there, I mean, everyone has updated their websites to make sure things are looking fresh and updated. Um, and so I think for just across, I think all schools, we've seen an increase in applications because of the easy accessibility of information. Yeah, I would, um, I would just echo the same sentiments that uh, my colleagues have said. Um, with PIP specifically, we're actually up 
um, over 50% in applications from this time last year. And last year was sort of a record-breaking year for us in terms of applications as well. So um, really been an unprecedented year. Um, it's a good problem, I guess, for us to have, um, really. Um, but it, it has made some, some difficult conversations with some of our students. Um, it's been become a little bit more competitive, especially with some of our more professional schools, um, like our business school and our, um, our engineering school as well. Um, so yeah, we're definitely seeing uh, just an increase across the board, um, across all facets, um, international, um, diverse populations as well. Um, right now, we're trying to close on a close to, um, we're trying to close on close to 45% out of state. Um, so we're in Pennsylvania, so we're trying to um, get as close to 45% out of state uh, population as we can. So we want really a good balance between in-state um, versus out of state. So, um, you know, a lot of different things changing. Um, of course, we are still test, uh, we're test optional as well. Um, so I think, you know, us switching to test optional has uh, really provided um, an open doors for students who typically wouldn't apply to us who thought that, you know, they weren't admissible just because of test scores or what have you. So I, thought, I know that's already been stated, but that's sort of the, the trend that we're at um, with it. And not to sound too repetitive, but I hate to feel left out. So I'll jump on and let you know that Clemson has seen an increase in applications as well. Um, so just to put a couple of, of numbers on it, uh, previous, so two years ago, prior to the whole COVID test optional thing, um, record number of applications for Clemson in a single cycle never eclipsed 30,000. It was 29,600. Uh, then last year came around and it was test optional and everybody was at home sitting in front of computer screens. So it became easier than ever to apply to college. Um, and we saw our applicant pool jump up to 47,000 is kind of what we ended at last year. Um, so far this year, and I'll have to you see what the numbers update to tomorrow, but we're right at 52,000 applications. So same general trends that some of my colleagues at their institutions are seeing that you know, things are up and, and continuing to stay that way, which uh, is exciting and it's a good problem to have, but does, you know, kind of like Jordan was just saying, does lend to some more difficult conversations because we're seeing things become more competitive than they ever have been. Um, and so from that standpoint, you know, some of our, you know, traditionally competitive majors, sports communication, nursing, health science, regular communication, architecture, those are staying competitive. And then we're also seeing some of our larger programs become more competitive just because of a volume of applications. Um, so biology or biological sciences, psychology and business all became more competitive this year than they ever have been. So um, as you're starting to think about what you might apply into and what majors to consider, you know, just know that those have all kind of been on the rise as well. Um, but I mean, again, it's very, very similar trends here as um, you've already heard about. So I will continue to beat the dead horse, but exciting times, but good problems to have as well. Yeah, they, they sound like good problems when you have to suddenly read, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 more applications. I I feel for you guys and, and the tough work that you do. And I, I, I know that it has impacted our students um, as we've seen schools that were typically not as selective become much more selective because of just the sheer increase in volume and the fact that you simply can't build dorms and grow overnight. It, it takes time to take to make those institutional changes. So I guess that leaves me with, with this next question because it's constantly asked by you know, students when they're going through this process. I think about all of my meetings right now with 11th grade students who are saying, so if I don't submit my scores and, and Dan from Rowan touched on, you know, if your test optional, your test optional. So we're gonna look at everything else and our students know what that is. That's the transcript and the rigor and the grade trends and all of the other soft factors, if you will, you know, activities and interest if it's calculated, letters of rec, essays. Can you talk a little bit about what it takes to build that great application if that, that standard measure isn't there? If you choose not to send your scores, um, talk a little bit about where that energy goes, um, how you're reviewing applicants, you know, maybe without scores, without lending too much of your inside uh, scoop and admissions. But it's, it's con concern for students is I don't submit my scores. What does that mean for me? Where should I put my energy in my overall application? So at least at uh, BU, we have a holistic application review process. I'm sure that's the same for many of the schools represented here tonight. Um, and I mean, what we mean by that is that we are looking at and giving genuine weight to all pieces of the application that we have. So if a student, you know, sends test scores, that's going to be included in the review. If they don't, then it won't. Um, I often sort of describe it a bit like if all of the pieces of a an application we're sitting on like a balancing scale and carrying weight um, and they're all sort of pushing and pulling on one another and academics at least for us at BU are the most important thing we want to make sure that students 
are going to be academically prepared to do well at BU. So let's say that's the heaviest piece on the balancing scale, um, you know, but everything else is there too. And it's carrying weight and pushing and pulling on one another and sort of balancing out to create this final picture of a student and their application. If a student does not submit test scores, that's just one thing that's not sitting on the balancing scale. So everything else is just carrying a little bit more weight. Um, and again, academics are the number one most important thing. So if we don't have test scores, that just means we're really going to be looking at the student's transcript, their GPA, the courses that they've chosen to take, how rigorous are those courses. Um, but all of the other pieces of the application matter as well. The essays, the recommendations, the extracurricular activities. We want to make sure that students are also going to be a fit for BU in the ways that they're engaging with their communities, with their families, with their schools, whatever that looks like for them. Um, so really, truly, I would just second what you said, Jen. Um, a student is not being disadvantaged by not submitting test scores. Um, it just means that we are going to be relying on everything else that's there. So they should, you know, put their, obviously, their effort into their academics and school and their essays um, and engaging in their communities with, in whatever way that looks for them. Yeah, I would, um, I actually would echo, echo that sentiment. Um, that's sort of the same example that I use when I speak about test optional. Um, I, I will say, at least for PIPT, um, we really don't have a preference for students applying with test scores or without test scores. Um, so we, we don't show favoritism. Um, much like Isabella said, um, if the test score uh, factors, sorry, if the test scores isn't there, uh, we would just look at the other um, the other factors of the of the student profile uh, with a little bit more weight. And that's pretty much how that works. Um, as far as test scores are concerned, if you're trying to figure out you know whether I should submit test scores or if I shouldn't submit test scores, um, I think I speak for all of us when I say like at least on our website or you could possibly ask an admissions uh, representative from whatever school that you're interested in. Uh, most schools they do include like the middle fifty percent range for students who have applied in the past and who uh, you know who had the application reviewed with test scores and were and were admitted. Um, so you can take a look and, and look at you know the previous previous class profiles and see sort of how your scores would line up. Um, and you could decide if you want to submit test scores or not test or not or not submit test scores. Great. Go ahead, Go ahead. Uh, let, let me be clear regarding, and, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with both my colleagues that, that just spoke, and uh, we're pretty much in that same direction. The only time the SAT will matter, uh, and we get lots of students from this particular high school uh, that are applying for our Albert Drummond Honors College. And so for students who are applying for the Honors College, that group will be required to submit a um, SAT score or an ACT score. Um, and so uh, otherwise, uh, no, that there's certainly no penalty uh, for students who are applying for regular admissions if you do not choose to submit the uh, SAT or ACT score. So that's what I want to share. When in doubt, three years is greater than three hours, which means whether you submit test scores or not, high school performance will always be the most important thing that we're going to consider. Those three years or in some you know cases, three plus years worth of work um, are going to carry you know a significant amount of weight especially in comparison to those scores. So is there a disadvantage to applying test optional? No, but I also like to say that a good score can certainly help, right? So then you might go, well, Evan, what's a good score? And my answer, as is the case with a lot of test optional questions, is it depends, right? It depends on what the score is. It depends on what kind of student you are. And it depends on how those two go together. So we can sit here and the six of us or seven of us, we can talk about test optional for hours on end. But really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is a little bit of self-identification, right? What kind of student are you? What kind of score do you have? And is that score, especially in comparison to your high school performance, an accurate representation of yourself uh, and your academic abilities? So, you know, at the end of the day, the decision's on you, right? And there's some, there, you know, that's empowering, right? You get to decide whether you want to send that score to us or not. But, you know, that's not a decision to take lightly because you've got to see, okay, does my score stack up with my high school performance? Are they on the same playing field? And if so, that probably bodes well for you. If your score is better than your high school performance, you probably want to send that in as well. If your score maybe isn't on that same level as your high school performance, or maybe isn't kind of within those middle 50% or, you know, maybe it's on the lower end of that, then maybe it's not necessarily doing you any good. So 
Um, you know, there's definitely no disadvantage to applying test optional. We also can't unsee a score. So if you do send us a score, can that help us make a more accurate decision on your application? Yes. Is it a decision you're going to necessarily like? Maybe not. Um, so there's a lot kind of up in the air when it comes to test optional. But again, at the end of the day, it's really on you and kind of your, again, self-identification and determination about how your score and your high school performance reflect you um, as an individual and as your academic abilities. And I would like to add kind of pulling away from the test scores a little bit is the fact that um, I personally care and Lafayette cares about the student's efficacy on behalf of their application. And so put, your, put a little bit of yourself in there. Well, we get sometimes our stealth applicants where, you know, the students are not really putting a lot of effort into the application, where the essay may be a previous paper you've written, the Y Lafayette or supplemental answers are just a few sentences long. I mean, you're applying to colleges across the United States and you're trying to show them why you want to go to that institution. And we wanna know why as well. And we wanna know what you're bringing to the table and how you can benefit our community, but also how we can benefit you. And so take some time in the column and application to really kind of share with us who you are as a person. Because the common application has a lot of different touch points. Some of it is are things that you cannot control, like your letters of recommendation, what your counselors are gonna say. Some things you might have a little of control, such as your academics and what classes you choose. And some things you have a lot of control, like your essay and your supplementals. And those points of control are things that you can control. And so try to take some time, especially since you guys are not seniors just yet, maybe over the summers to think about what essays you wanna, what topic of essay you wanna, to write about? Who do you think should write your letters of recommendation? Um, who would be a great advocate for you? What should you write and why? how should you answer some supplementals and supplemental answers? Um, it's really important that you try to share as much as yourself and as much as you're comfortable with, with us so that we can create a picture of who you are. Because when we get your application, it's most likely going to be on a screen and we're reading it at odd hours of the day trying to understand who this person is. But the more passion, the more care and the more bragging rights you put into your application, the stronger we can advocate for you in committee conversations, in conversations that matter on behalf of you. And so that's what we really care about. And so and that's what I would recommend is that test scores are one aspect of your application, but there's a whole other, there's many other factors. And so the ones that you can control, the ones that you have say in, are the ones that we want to hear from. And so take some time to really put together a very well thought out application. We can tell when students submit the application minutes before the deadline when they were like, oh, yep, they thought we just put it in the application, see what happens. We can tell when you do that. And so it really does um, bode well for you if you put some time and care and effort. Um, one thing that I'll add, and, and I agree with what everyone is saying here, but I think one of the big key takeaways from what you're hearing and even seeing questions in the chat is um, the importance of researching the schools that you're interested in. Um, we're all giving different answers. Uh, and, and often in the questions in the chat, um, we're saying it varies, it depends. Every institution is different. Uh, so when you're thinking, all right, I got an 1100 on the SATs, you're gonna have schools that absolutely send that 1100. That is a great score. You're absolutely going to get admitted. Are you gonna get into Harvard with an 1100? Probably not. Um, so it's important to do that research. If you get a 1500, 1600, show off that score, uh, send that score in. Uh, but like everybody say, is saying, it's not, it's not just about test scores. Um, and it's important to um, learn about the college that you are looking at, do your research. Um, there's plenty, plenty of resources available for you uh, to learn about us uh, and learn about other schools out there from Jen or Ms. Mrs. Nectarline, uh, from our websites, social media, and the millions of other websites out there on the internet where you can, can, you can learn about schools. Um, so my big piece of advice is make sure you're doing that research. That's great. Thank you, guys. And um, I appreciate you, Jade, seg segueing into some other topics because I definitely wanted to cover um, you know, these trends, which pushed us into test optional, which um, is, is an important topic and one that so many of our, our students and families have questions about. So I'm, I'm glad we covered that well, but you did segue into some of the other things that are considered and Dan's certainly talking about researching schools. So um, we, we talk a lot at Central about building a list and, and students have just so many options. And we talk about utilizing criteria, location and size and things like that. 
And of course, having a well-balanced list. I'd love to hear you piggyback on that. I know that a lot of what we say are things that, that we hear from you guys about building a healthy list, but any, any words of wisdom? We do certainly have sophomores on tonight who are probably thinking, I just did a search on Naviance and it still spit out 350 results. How do I narrow this down? Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, what colleges offer through um, virtual programming on campus? How do you just really get that list narrowed down? I'll go first because I'm not convinced I have a great answer to this question. So I'll just go ahead and get it out of the way quickly and let those who have better answers expound upon those. Um, because my list had one school on it, right? So when I was in high school, I, when I was a senior, I sent in one application to one school. Um, ain't hard to figure out which one that was, but that's kind of the opposite of what you should do, right? Now, now that I'm in this role, I realized that my parents should not have let me do that. But as the oldest of three, they didn't really know because they hadn't been through the college application process in 25 years. So um, from kind of a narrowing it down standpoint and some of the resources and information you can find before you really even step foot on campus, I think that is kind of a silver lining of the whole pandemic and everything being virtual, right, is that there's way more information readily available than there ever has been. Having to convert everything to a virtual context in a relatively quickly fashion, um, you know, made us, forced us really to put as much as we could in as many places as we could because you couldn't come see us and you couldn't visit campus and talk to us face to face. So we had to find another way to get that information to you. So, you know, it, it can certainly be overwhelming, you know, trying to comb through the thousands of higher education institutions there are in this country. Um, but, you know, if you start with kind of your priority list of what you're looking for out of your dream school, um, my list had three things on it. I wanted to go where I was gonna be happiest, healthiest and most successful. Um, and luckily, Clemson checked off all of those boxes. And so as you're kind of listing out what is important to you, whether that's, you know, geography or whether that's a certain program or major that you're looking for, if weather is something you're looking for, we got you covered down here. But, um, you know, as you're starting to list some of those things out, find what fits your criteria, find, you know, what's going to check off all of those boxes for you. And that should hopefully help you whittle down uh, that list from a, a large one to maybe a more manageable one. I think Evan really pointed out to it, a really important thing is that whatever you are looking for, parents, family members, aunts, neighbors, friends of some strangers you may know, they're all going to say, oh, apply to this school or look at this school, which is good. And you should certainly look at them. But you're the ones who are going off to college. You are the ones who are going to spend four years in an institution and you're going to be graduating from that school. And so really take some time to reflect on what things you value. For Evan, it was, <laughs> I love your answer, Evan, um, but you really need to think about what do you want? Is there a specific program that you're looking for? Um, maybe there's some things that you, are priorities and other things that are maybe secondary or tertiary things that you want to consider, um, but you really need to focus on what you are looking for and what you want in a school. You are so lucky that New Jersey has such a wide range of schools and just within driving distances. So even take some opportunity, especially the sophomores and juniors over the summer, just visit schools all around New Jersey. You have private schools, you have big universities, you have everything in between. And as you look at these schools, you're gonna to start to realize, you know what, I like this school, or I like this environment, or I'm not sure about this one. And as you start to whittle down your preferences, then you're gonna be able to start saying, there's a school that I know I want and here's the parameters. And then from there, your guidance counselors can really help you start putting names to those, um, to those parameters and really use your resources at the high school because they are an abundance of, well, of, of oh my gosh, of information. Um, and certainly listen to them because they have such great information and, they can't, and they're in great communication with us. And so we can tell them the information that um, is helpful to you if maybe some folks are too scared to reach out to us. But the most important thing is that you guys are going off to college. And so find schools that you are looking for. And yes, there are hundreds and thousands of schools out there. But if you know that I love big schools or I love small schools or this is the type of environment that I want, then your guidance counselors and your family members can start whittling down those lists. I think that's the best way to start versus starting from, oh, I want to go to the most prestigious school in the, in the country and then go from there. That may not be the best fit because, you know, they don't accept many people. But there are a lot of great schools out there that could be the best fit for you. And you may not even consider them because you're just so caught up on the sticker name of the institution. But really what's important is the fact that regardless of where you go, you're gonna find the best fit for you and you're gonna have such a wonderful college experience. 
and it's going to be you going off to college. So you should be the ones driving this bus and you should be the ones making these decisions with the support and the help from everyone around you. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, Dave, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, like fit is not just academic, right? It's not just a school having the academic program that you want. Um, fit is social and pre-professional and environmental, and it's also financial. Um, I think it's really important as you're building a list to know what you're applying to when it comes to the financial side of things. And maybe this is something that's a little bit more for parents than students, um, but checking out what are their financial aid policies at the school. Do they meet full need? Do they not meet full need? Are there need-based options? Are there merit-based scholarship options? Um, that's, I think, something that's important to keep in mind because um, it's really heartbreaking to end up in a situation where you've gotten into the school that you felt like was the number one best fit for you and you're not able to make it work financially. Um, so I think it's best to think about that from the get-go um, and be prepared and be already having those conversations with your family. Um, when it comes to all the other different types of fit, academic, social, et cetera, um, Folks have kind of already touched on this. Do you want a large or a small school, an urban school? Do you want a suburban school? Um, big sports culture, no sports. Think about where can you envision yourself living for four years. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is <laughs> don't apply places just to apply places because you want to have a big long college list and because you think you can get in and, and you want to get that acceptance letter, but you know you're never going to actually go there. You're just going to burn yourself out writing all those supplemental essays and you're not going to be able to put in all of the effort that you want to put in to the supplemental essays and the supplements for the schools that you actually really do care about and we can kind of tell when you don't care <laughs> it shows through in your essay um, and when you really really care about a school and you're invested um, it shows through in a positive way so don't add schools to your list just for the sake of adding schools to your list. I missed most of this because I lost power because we're having bad storms. So I won't give any 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 advice that I think that my colleagues probably have already talked about. My one piece of advice, create an email address specifically for college searches because you're going to get lots of emails. And I'll leave it at that. Or just keep your central inbox very organized. Folders are your friend. Folders are your friend. And no worries, Dan. We're up here. I am in Flemington, and we're hearing rumbles out there. So we're gonna get our fingers crossed. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about because I see some questions in the chat. And thank you, your attendees, for putting questions in, and, and my admission colleagues for answering them so well. Um, but I know that there's always questions about essays. Um, you know, that's a staring at the blank screen. Where do I start? You know, we we do a couple. Um, you know, conversations about it in some of our college planning sessions and groups with students. And I know there's a lot of um, resources and supports out there, you know, different essay boot camp style things in the summer. But I, I tell students that we give a lot of different advice about it, but, you know, tell your story. And, and so that's sort of where we start the conversation. And we certainly direct students to the prompts that are taken um, on the Common App, taken by so many schools. I think I'm all Common App schools. So I don't want to Oh yeah, everyone's on their head. I'm just double checking. Um, mostly, um, you know, we send those prompts out to students. We give them a little something to work with. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know our audience would too. Um, I don't know if anyone's hearing all the thunder here. So, um, but tell us a little bit about that. Reading an essay, your short answers or your supplements if you have them. Can you shed a little bit of light and, and offer some advice on students who are staring at a blank screen wondering where to be in? Um, I guess I'll start. So. Um, I always advise students um, to use the essay or the Common App essay or personal statement or what have you, um, just as an opportunity for you to um, present yourself as a way um, to allow admissions offices to get to know you as an individual versus, you know, just the student, um, just a student. Um, I always, so I think there's, there's sort of this idea that students have to have like some crazy experience or story that they have to write about or that they should have that they should write about. Um, and if you have one of those experiences, whether it's a negative or positive experience, that's great. Um, you know, feel free to share with share whatever you want with us. Um, but you don't need, you know, a crazy experience. A lot of people may not necessarily have experiences that they would constitute as crazy. 
Um, I always tell students that, um, you know, this is sort of your opportunity to be creative. Um, talk about some talk about things that are um, interested, interesting and important to you. Um, I can tell you one of my favorite essays that I remember uh, that I remember, sorry, that I read. Uh, student was talking about um, his online gaming and how he sort of led his um, his online gaming team to to win a game. Um, and it was really interesting to me because I'm not really into the online gaming per, uh, per se and it really showed like leadership quality. So um, if you could find Jack, like just one little experience that you can really speak about um, depending on the prompts that are presented to you, um, then that's really what we're looking for. Just something that makes you stick out um, and really let your individualism shine through, uh, through your essay. Yeah, I often tell students, um, you know, we, we can see your academics, uh, we can see your, your transcripts and your test scores, and we're getting recommendations from your counselors and your teachers. Use the essay to tell us about you, tell us something unique about you. If you had certainly touch on academics, if sophomore year, something happened first semester, you tanked your grades uh, because something happened in your life. It's a good opportunity to explain that to us. But outside of that, tell us something, something unique about you that's going to help tell a story um, to make us say, hey, you know what? I could see this, this student on campus. Um, this, this person would be a, a great addition to our community. Um, in terms of putting your essays together, um, my biggest pieces of, of advice from, uh, from reading some essays is answer the question. Um, I can't tell you how many times students just upload any essay, um, that's not going to work for us. You know, we wanna see you answer the question that we're asking. Um, I often get asked, you know, well, what happens if I have a typo and things like that happen. That's not a turnoff for me. Um, my, big, my biggest turnoff besides not answering the question is when students refer to the university in the essay, but refer to a different university. Um, that shows me that you're using the same essay for multiple institutions, which isn't necessarily an issue, but you weren't careful. Um, you know, I get a lot of cross stops with, with Tony from NJIT. Um, we both have, you know, large engineering programs. Um, so, you know, I can't wait to join NJIT's uh, engineering program. You know, that's, that, that shows me that you didn't take the time uh, to really uh, make sure that, that you were um, answering the question and, and reviewing what you're supposed to. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly um, um, with both my colleagues and what they've shared thus far. Yeah, so use it as an opportunity to tell your story. Um, and everyone here tonight, they mentioned that um, we've all received more and more applications. So we're looking at lots of transcripts. Um, and um, yeah, the, the transcripts tell the story with regard to your preparedness to be admitted to the university. Um, but we want to know a lot more about who you are um, how you made the decision, how you plan on using your um, entry to the university as uh, a vehicle to get you to where you want to be at the end of the road. And so, yeah, help us uh, have a better idea of who you are, what you're going to bring to the table, and how you plan on uh, melding into the student body. Uh, that's important. And uh, you certainly want to be able to say, hey, I'm what you're looking for. And so, yeah, the academic record says that. Too, but then also we want to know if you're going to be a good fit for the university. The best way for you to do that is to really uh, expound on who you are in your essay. Can I just add two quick things before we end this question? Um, the first thing I'll say is try to represent who you genuinely are and not who you think we want you to be. Um, I read so many essays where I can tell that the student um, has this idea in their head of a student that they think we want to admit and, and they're trying to represent themselves as that student, but you don't need to do that. Be authentic, be thoughtful, be self-aware, and that will shine through in your essay. Um, the second thing, and I think maybe Jordan touched on this a little bit, um, but I think students feel like they need to share like the hardest thing that's ever happened to them in their essay. Um, and there's just this kind of culture around college essays where they feel like this is gonna get me into college. Um, please do not feel like you have to do that. Don't feel like you need to write an essay about something that you know, writing the essay is going to be a traumatic experience for you. 
you don't have to do that. You can tell us about anything about yourself that feels important and significant um, and, and never feel like you have to share something that maybe doesn't feel so good to share. So that's all I'll say. Well, and then very quickly on the other side of things, because I don't know about some of y'all on the other end of this, but all this talk about essays got me real nervous. So let's pivot a little bit and take a collective sigh of relief because Clemson doesn't require any essays. Um, we also are not looking at the written section of the SAT or ACT. So there is zero required writing to get into Clemson. You're welcome. Um, but I think a lot of what you've already heard rings true, right? And I really like Dan's point about, you know, use that space to tell us something about you. The rest of the application might not cover. But um, as far as Clemson is concerned, it's an optional component of the application. So you can rightfully assume how important it is, especially in comparison to some of that required material. So we're not expecting you to write the next great Dickens novel because we know we weren't those type of people and those type of students either. One of the first things I did when I started this job three years ago was pull up my own application because I couldn't even remember if I wrote any kind of essay or personal statement. And when I pulled up my application, my personal statement was about that long. And it said, hey, I've always wanted to go to Clemson. Can't wait to see you on campus. Go Tigers. Like that was basically what it said. So don't put all of the pressure on yourself to write the next great American novel because I'll go ahead and break it to you. That's not going to happen, but it's also probably not going to matter either. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. There's a lot more to look forward to senior year than just staring at a computer screen and writing an essay all the time. My suggestion for the essay, but part also for the additional information, the community disruption or the supplementals is to know your audience. You damn, um, Dan mentioned earlier how there might how some students might put the school's name in their common essay, which you can if you want to, but that probably is more appropriate in the supplementals of why are you applying to that school or how are you a best fit for that institution. Um, there was a comment about maybe showing some maybe hardships that you've faced or maybe some other personal, um, whether it's health, mental or emotional things that you've maybe have gone through. Maybe that's a better fit for the additional information section rather than being the topic of your essay. So really know your audience and know what is the best appropriate for each section because there are multiple ways that you can highlight who you are. The other thing is writing is a process. It's not something that none, no one, even the great Dickens and everyone else, they didn't sit there and write a novel and in their first shot. You have to take the time and effort to go through proofreading, to go through multiple drafts. And that is why my recommendation for the juniors is just think about your topic for the summer. Start thinking about an outline because you're gonna take so much weight off of your shoulders when you don't have to do your essay in your senior year on top of your extracurriculars and your academics and your AP and IB. Like there's so many other things that you're going to be distracted with. Why would you write your college essay in your fall semester? Why not do it over the summer when you have a little bit more time to breathe? Um, so proofread also is important because for the schools that do read the essays, we wanna see, have a well-polished essay. We, this is your time to shine and your way to show us that, you know, you can write a well-written piece because this is our way of seeing, well, are you a good writer? Are you gonna be up to par with the amount of writing that is at our institution? Um, and if that's the case, well, then you need to proofread your essays. You need to make sure they read well. Um, have your guidance counselor, have your family members, have English teachers proofread but I would recommend not to edit. We don't wanna edit your voice because your voice is unique and your voice is your own. And so we wanna hear what it's like to be from a 17, 18 year old. We don't wanna hear from what it's like to be from somebody else that's a little bit older. Um, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind is that we know that some students may have gone through a lot of life, um, life struggles. Some students may not have. Some students may have a lot of different experiences and that's totally fine. But the point of the, col the college essay is for us to get to know you. So whether it's your favorite hobby, whether it's maybe a particular event. Oh my gosh, I just heard thundering. So it's so loud here. Um, whether you, whether you um, have faced um, hardship or not, you can write anything you want. I mean, I've had students who wrote an excellent essay on Dungeons and Dragons, on their favorite movie, on their, maybe they binge a lot of different um, TV shows. It could be any topic you want but it's something that's uniquely you because you're passionate about that. And when you write about something that you're passionate about, it is so easy to write because you don't have to do research. You don't have to find a way of finessing it to make it look fancy. You're just genuinely writing from the heart. And that's what I recommend you guys to do. Um, so that's my two cents. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Really, really good sound advice on essay writing. Another topic I, um, I wanna bring up that 
we get a lot of questions about, uh, I think a lot more concerned questions in, in the recent months is talking with our juniors who spent, you know, the first two years of high school with a lot of limitations to the way they spent their time outside the classroom. And we talk a lot about extracurriculars. We really um, emphasize quality over quantity at Central and that we're not looking for our students to have super long lists of activities, but rather depth and, um, and, and showing passion and, and interest with, with a fewer things. But our students are concerned because they, they ask questions a lot. I don't have service as if they need to have service to get into college, or I don't have leadership hours um, as if they need to be leaders to be you know, admitted into a school. And they're really concerned that they've had these limitations. So we tell them, we assure them, I want them to hear it from you, um, that it's okay, that you understand there's been a lot of challenges to doing things um, you know, out in the community over the last two years. But can you shed a little bit of light on the importance of activities, um, the importance of non-academic factors um, like that extracurricular time in your review? So that's going to be another optional component of Clemson's application. So again, in comparison to what is required, you can uh, you know, pretty accurately assume how important that's going to be. But as you are filling out the activity section or as you are you know, listing all of your extracurriculars, putting a resume together, whatever, if you're looking at it going, oh, I really didn't do a whole lot over the last two years, it's okay because we know that, right? We didn't do a whole lot over the last two years either. While you were sitting at home staring at your screen, we were sitting at our house sitting at our screen. We wanted to get out and do things too and we didn't have the ability either. Um, so, you know, we, we've been taking that into account already, right? Because the last two application cycles have had some variation of, of COVID related impacts on it. And, you know, next year's will as well, those who were, you know, freshmen in high school when, when COVID first started. We're, you know, we're, we're weighing all that, we're taking that into account and we're really viewing everybody through that COVID lens. But again, you know, like I said, at Clemson, that information, you know, on the application is gonna be um, optional. It's gonna be supplemental. So probably not gonna weigh as heavily as some of those required academic factors. So if you're thinking that your extracurriculars or that your outside of the classroom involvement opportunities aren't quite up to par, as long as you've got a good, strong, like academic body of work to back some of that up, it's all gonna balance out throughout our review anyway. So I'd say not to worry too much about that either. I would um, somewhat second what Evan said in that we all lived through the last two very weird years. Um, and we understand that like, things were kind of spooky and weird and you probably didn't participate in all the things that you wanted to participate in. Um, so we're definitely coming at it from a very human angle and we understand what you've been experiencing and we certainly would not have ever expected you to participate in something that maybe you didn't feel safe participating in anymore. Maybe you didn't have the opportunity to participate in anymore. Um, when it comes to extracurriculars, I usually suggest that students just spend their time in ways that is meaningful to them. And that is very different for every single student. So it could mean that you're in clubs at your school. Maybe you have a leadership position of some kind. Perhaps you are playing sports, um, but it could also mean that you're doing some kind of community service, or perhaps you have a part-time job. Maybe you help work at a family business. Um, maybe you have a younger sibling or an aging grandparent that you take care of after school. Really, whatever it is that you're doing with your time, we would love to hear about it. We just wanna see that you are contributing that you're contributing to your community, to your school, maybe to your family, whatever that looks like for you. Um, there's really no formula. There's no right answer. There's no like golden activity that if you only do this activity, you'll get into college. Um, it, unfortunately, I guess, doesn't really work that way. Um, we just wanna see again that, that you're engaging in meaningful ways. What you're saying is we don't need to do five to ten thousand dollars summer programs and think that they're going to help us get into college because that's the burning question of the week from our our rising uh, our sophomores and our juniors. That's that's a lot of that's coming in because those programs are being advertised that you know students have been honored in a fancy envelope with a gold seal to spend six thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars on a one week summer program and they think it's going to 
impact their ability to get into college. Thank you colleagues for reassuring our community that that is not the case, that you don't need to do any big fancy summer program. It's actually pretty cool to work and get a part-time job and then show a little bit of responsibility and, and make a couple bucks. So, all right, thank you. Anything else on activities? Um, Spend that money and take a vacation with your family and enjoy. <laughs> Thanks, well, I, I, yeah. I, have a, I have a question being from the south and not really knowing what y'all do up there in jersey who's running summer programs that go off for seven thousand dollars a person because i'm in the wrong line of work i'll tell you Evan, it's, it's wild it's wild and, and there's there's so many opportunities and experiences for students in the summer that are really worthy that, that are enjoyable like the things dan said be a teenager do teenager things like i've probably said this a dozen times this week, it's really okay to just get a part-time job, scoop an ice cream. You're a teenager, you should have those experiences. Those um, opportunities in the summer are not gonna make or break your college application decision or future. So thank you guys for, for uh, reassuring. Anything else on activities, anything else in general on just some of these other factors, you know, when we're not talking academics and scores because not every student has straight A's, not every student, has a stellar transcript, but they're all getting into great schools and how are they doing it? And thank you for shedding light on essays and activities and demonstrating um, those factors. Um, obviously letters of recommendation and for some of you, they're not completely required, but for others, yes. Any information that you wanna share as our juniors are going through just the initial phase right now of, of verbally requesting those letters, any tips, any advice on that? Um. Well, with, with PIS specifically, we actually don't prefer letters of recommendations. Um, if you're going to send a letter from a teacher or, uh, or someone, uh, we'd much rather that letter explain something that isn't explained on your application or can't be explained through the transcript. Um, so maybe something happened um, at home, right, that, that you want someone to speak about um, on your behalf, or maybe, um, you know, you didn't do too well in a course, maybe you got a C or something in chemistry and um, you know a letter would explain why that grade dropped um, but you know just sort of your sort of your run-of-the-mill um, you know uh, letter recommendation where you know a, a, a teacher or whoever is you know just sort of saying that you're a hard worker because you're receiving an A in biology um, but the pit specifically we're, we're not necessarily looking for for that for those letters. Yeah at Rowan we don't require uh, recommendations we certainly will accept them if if you just choose to send them. But what I will say is, um, and you know, learning this from talking to my colleagues, think hard about who you choose to write your letters. Don't pick the popular coach because they're the popular coach. If they're the popular coach, they're probably getting asked by everyone to write a letter. So think about that. Are they really going to have the time? Not that they don't want to, but are they going to have the time to really write a letter about you? Or are they just using a generic letter for everyone? So think hard about who you're choosing uh, and ask your teachers and your counselors early if you choose to do that. Um, I see uh, Mrs. Nectarline kind of smirking, but your counselors and your teachers spend a tremendous amount of time writing these letters, um, often off hours. Um, so ask early and, and be, um, you know, think about who you're asking and really um, ask the people that are going to write you a genuine letter. And with that comes a very friendly and gentle reminder to all juniors to turn in their feedback forms that are due this spring. I know that uh, Mr. Maldonado, Ms. Kelly, and Ms. Bush would greatly appreciate those forms um, to be turned in. Don't forget your parent section, your section. Um, and that's a pretty standard thing across high schools. I'm sure my colleagues know that we sort of call those brag sheets. And what that does is it really provides an extension of information to your grade level counselor, because you all, um, all juniors, and of course our sophomores listening should know this for next year, you will receive an automatic letter of recommendation from your counselor um, for this process. And of course, as we suggested back in January in our college planning groups to utilize the second semester we're in now to verbally ask um, one to two teachers for letters of rec. So thank you guys for your advice. I watch the clock. I wanna save time for some kind of closing thoughts on, um, Things that, and this can be a little bit of everything. There's been just outstanding advice given um, to our students tonight that I'm sure they're, they're talking away as they go through the process. And I wanna leave that with you to offer any just general advice from each of you. 
but also talk about maybe anything you're, you're seeing come down the pipeline. I know right now, April 7th, the focus for the six of you is building the next class. I think that's going to be, um, is that 26? Is that the, that's the number, class of 26 you're building as you go through the next couple of weeks um, as we approach May 1. But anything you think you're going to see next year, I, I know the rise in applications is, is, um, is obvious, but anything your offices are talking about that are that you think are going to trend next year, and then of course, please feel free to tie that in with any closing advice. So um, we'll go one by one. Feel free to take it away as we as we get near the end of our program. Honestly, the only thing that we are anticipating is for our applicant pool to continue to grow. Um, I'm I feel confident that next year's pool will be larger than this year's pool. Um, and in a way, that's great. We love that students are so interested in BU, but it also does mean, you know, we're still shooting for the same class size of 3,100 students. So it means that our decision-making becomes more difficult. We have to make more hard decisions, which is sort of the, the downside of that. Um, gosh, in terms of <laughs> general overall advice, don't freak out. Um, it's it, fe it feels right now like the college search and application process is like this life or death situation and it feels like your whole world. But in what, a year and a half when you're starting your freshman year, wherever you end up, you're going to realize that it, it felt like your whole world, but it all worked out and you ended up where you were supposed to end up. Um, and if for some reason you end up where maybe you weren't supposed to end up, there's always transfer admissions, baby. So, you know, it's you're doing your best to make the best choice for yourself. Um, and that is worth your time and emotional energy, but it's it's not the it's not the end all be all, I'll say. <laughs> I have to agree with Isabella where um, college admissions is there's so many more applications being submitted to all of our institutions and the pools are getting more and more competitive every year. Um, and so I am going to reiterate where try to advocate for yourself for the schools that look for demonstrated interest, they look for a letter recommendation to look for different aspects of the application reach out to us and ask us questions or engage with us for the schools that don't then that's fine and know the fact that the strength of your application shines through the efforts that you put into it. Um, but my suggestion for the sophomores and juniors in this space is to really balance your mental health. I think that's really the thing that people need to pay attention to is the fact that life is getting more stressful and it should be something more and more students are talking about. But the fact that you should balance out your mental health with your physical, emotional, spiritual and everything else um, because you are young adults, you are learning to become real adults once you get into college and learning to, to, to know where and, where and when the places you get stressed and how to calm yourself and how to take care of yourself and how to feed yourself. And these are really important life skills um, that will do, that will bend, that will be, sorry, that will be well for you in terms of being a full grown adult. And so I really do emphasize that talking about your mental health and being mindful of your mental health is really important, particularly when you go off to college and the structure of high school where it's, it's a little bit more rigid, where you know the classes you're taking and you know when times you are in school. But in college, some of that structure goes away a little bit. You might have class, you might have a two hour break, you might have lunch, you might have some meetings, and then you might have another class. And so how do you spend your time and managing your time? Um, and knowing who you are and whether you know that 8 a.m. class may not be the best for you or maybe that a.m. class is the way for you to get up and get your day started. Um, but really starting to know yourself and getting familiar with what makes you comfortable and what are your and what makes you stressed is really important because that's how you can take care of yourself. This is an exciting and somewhat confusing time of year for me because we've got a little bit of everything, right? We've got, you know, juniors and sophomores getting this process started early. We've got seniors who are, you know, trying to make a decision. We've got some who are still waiting on decisions. And my piece of advice typically doesn't change regardless of what the event is or who my target audience is. So when I see some of y'all in a year at one of our admitted student receptions, you'll probably hear this again. Um, but my piece of advice usually starts with a brief backstory. Um, I have two younger brothers, the middle one of which is four years younger than me. 
So I graduated college the same year that he graduated high school. I and mean, like I said, I started this job about a month after that. So I was home one weekend over the summer before he was getting ready to move off to college. And my dad, you know, we were in the kitchen. My dad looked at me and he was like, all right, Mr. Hotshot admissions counselor, you just finished what your brother's about to start. What's your piece of advice to him? And I was like, well, throw me under the bus. Why don't you, dad? I just started. I don't know what I'm doing. But uh, I looked at my brother and I just told him, I said, don't worry about it. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, whatever that it is, because whether you're getting ready to start the college admissions process or whether you're getting ready to start college, there's a lot of unknowns, right? There's a lot out there that you can be stressed about. There's a lot that you can be you know, concerned about. And I think Isabella and Jay just touched on a lot of that, right? Looking out for yourself and, and kind of staying grounded within all of that. And so that's kind of what my you know, summary and piece of advice ends up amounting to as well, is that there's going to be so much out there that you're going to worry about. And you just can't because you got to trust the process because you're going to end up exactly where you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to do. And you'll be able to look back, you know, in hindsight and realize that that was the case. So, um, you know, as you know, you're moving through the summer, really before your senior year and you're starting to gear up and, you know, get ready to hit the ground running with this application process, it can get a little overwhelming and you can't let it because senior year is a lot of fun. There's a lot to look forward to this fall. And, you don't want to miss out on that because you're too busy, you know, writing that essay. You're worried about submitting a certain application. So just whatever that it is for you and whenever it comes along, don't worry about it because it'll work out. So just trust the process and enjoy the ride. I can't tell you how important it is to um, really enjoy this time of year. And yes, it is stressful. And yes, there is lots to consider. But I think if you do your research, and more importantly, uh, while doing your research and you identify uh, the institutions that you feel are gonna be the best fit for you, you gotta go there, you gotta touch it, you gotta feel it, you gotta smell it, you gotta make sure it's a good fit for you, you gotta make sure that um, it meets all your needs with regards to your comfort level. Do you wanna be in an urban environment, a suburban environment? Do you wanna be in state or out of state? Those are all things you need to consider. And then certainly you wanna consider price and also what the opportunities will be for a marriage scholarship for you. And so all that stuff combined kind of make up the whole picture for you. But I, I don't think that it's, um, for me anyway, and I can go back to, I, I graduated college way back in 1986, right? A lot of you uh, students, obviously, but even some of my colleagues here probably may not have been born back then. And so for me, I was, uh, <laughs> I got you, I got you. So um, uh, for me, you know, being a first generation kid where, um, and a lot of you have a big advantage in that you have access to the internet. Yeah, well, there's no internet around when I was in school, right? And so I had to figure out what's the SAT? How do I take that? How do I go about it? Do I have to get a money order to pay for that? I don't have a checking account. You know, all these little different factors uh, that I had to consider to go through that process. Um, but I didn't allow it to stress me and I certainly didn't allow it to deter me. I know I need to find my way to a college campus and get what I needed to ultimately get me to where I wanted to be in my life. And so don't let it stress you out. Yes, there's lots to consider. Yes, there's tons of information to plow through, but at the end of the road, and believe me when I tell you those four or five years that you do, they're gonna go by really, really fast. You'll, you'll be stunned how fast it'll go by. So enjoy the ride, uh, take it all in. And at the end of the row, you get your little pump and circumstance, you go across the stage, you'll take somebody's hand and you'll go off to do great things. So enjoy it. Don't let it stress you out. And just go through it and, and uh, continue uh, growing to be who you want to be down the road. I would say my, um, my piece of advice, um, just be don't be afraid to reach out uh, for help, right? Uh, you have a wonderful um, high school advising staff. Um, you also have the representatives on this board, on this um, on this panel, as well as um, the admissions offices of all of the schools that you might be interested in. Um, so give yourself grace. We understand that this is a process for you. Uh, we are all here um, to make this process as streamlined and as easy for you as possible. Um, control the things that you can control. Um, if you feel that you know you don't understand something, or you may have made a mistake on your application, or some sort of material that you're supposed to submit. Um, for the application, just reach out to us. Um, you know, we've we've been doing this for for a while. <laughs> um, really, uh, you know, um, you know, we we're, we're just all really here for you. So don't be afraid uh, to reach out for 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 assistance. Take it home, Dan. 
<laughs> You're on the spot. Sorry. Um, I don't know. I, I, everybody has such great, such great advice. Um, listen, at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of great, there's thousands of great colleges and universities in this country. Um, you know, we're representing a, a very small population of those, and we would love to have many of you uh, at our institutions. But there's a home and there's a fit for everybody. Uh, and um, you're going to have highs and you're going to have lows during this process. Um, forget about those lows um, and take advantage of those highs. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to find a great institution to attend. You're going to be successful after college. Uh, you're going to have a great career. Um, and that's the key takeaway that uh, you're going to enjoy your, your college life. Uh, Mr. Jackson, you know, mentioned how fast it goes. Uh, and it's true. You're probably sitting there, sitting there thinking how fast high school has gone. College goes even faster. Uh, and before you know it, you're an old guy like me with little kids and um, you're thinking, you know, you wish you were back in college. So um, enjoy the moments um, because they do go fast. But at the end of the day, know that you're going to end up where you're supposed to be. Um, so try not to stress too much about it. Awesome. Thank you. This, this was um, a lot of what we say in our offices, but I think really valuable for our attendees to hear it from you all tonight. So uh, a lot of you still hanging on and thank you for coming out tonight. And I can't believe the power held out. I'm here in Raritan Township. And I know many of you are, <laughs> some of you just a street away from me and it is, it's wild out there, but I'm glad we, we were able to get through this whole program. My colleagues, I thank you immensely. Your time, your expertise, your information is invaluable. It's so critical to us that, that students hear it from you. And for those who maybe haven't put their feet on a campus yet, to touch it, feel it, smell it. Tony, I agree, they have to do that eventually. But I think this was a really good opportunity for them to hear a lot of what they would hear on campus from you and your staff and your student ambassadors. And, people like that. So um, I, and the questions, great questions. And thank you again for answering those. So thank you for your time. Um, we appreciate it. Those of you, again, if you knew someone who you thought would benefit from this and listen to this tonight, it will be recorded and made available on 100 Central's YouTube channel. And I'll send a link out to our classes that we, we targeted for this program, our sophomore and junior classes and spread the word to anybody else. Again, colleagues, thank you. Best wishes. As we roll toward May 1, um, I admire the work you do, we all do, and we thank you so much. And, and students listening, these are familiar schools to us to see a lot of them visiting us uh, with us in the fall.